You're okay with this? We're gonna reconvene and start the session. So welcome to the shock patient from the field to the cath lab and the CCU or the CICU. So my name is Marc Jolicoeur. I'm an interventional cardiologist at the Montreal Heart Institute. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Johan Lamarche, who's um, uh, co-chairing the session with me. He's a cardiac surgeon and also an intensive care physician. Um, so we're gonna uh, have a great uh, sets of uh, discussion. So we've decided to recenter the presentation a little bit in that we were gonna dedicate the session to actual shock uh, and not so much on um, uh, the use of devices for uh, iris PCI. So we're gonna, we decided rather to embed the notion of iris PCI in a case presentation so that it would, um, I guess, make makes the uh, uh, session more streamlined. So with uh, no further ado, um, it, it is now my pleasure to introduce you to Mark Lefkowski. So because I've been told by Vlad that I need to say it. Um, yeah, okay, no, okay. So Mark, seriously, Mark Lefkowski is a um, uh, cardiologist at the Montreal Heart Institute, also specialized in intensive care unit. He's gonna um, uh, talk about the clinical approach to shock. So Mark. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, clicker, there we go. Um, so every time I give a presentation on shock, I realize that I've, I end up asking way more questions than I end up answering, but I think uh, the point is to sort of illustrate uh, the context of what shock is and sort of what it leads up to, to be in terms of prognosis and to sort of set up uh, our, our following speakers uh, to discuss uh, the management uh, thereof. Um, no disclosure for this. So some of the objectives in terms of uh, how shock you know, should and is a medical emergency, which sometimes people don't assume it is. Um, clinical diagnosis of shock, why is shock so difficult to manage? Uh, and even though I, you know, I read up a lot and a lot of my colleagues know it backwards and forwards, we're always puzzled by the patient who shows up uh, who just doesn't respond in the way we think he should. Um, so we'll try to discuss some of the reasons why uh, it might be like, it might be so. And in terms of who needs advanced support uh, and when, so we'll sort of start up on that. So you know, clinical cases, just in two slides. You know, a standard 57-year-old uh, white male active smoker with no real past medical history comes in with intermittent chest pains, uh, and by the time he shows up to the hospital, then you know he's he's found to have signs and symptoms of uh, of someone who's uh, who's in shock. You know, so he's uh, confused, he's pale, he's diaphoretic, hypotensive, tachycardic hypoxic on supplemental O2, uh, signs that he's clamped down peripherally, uh, oliguric um, with a Foley catheter in spite of uh, intravenous Lasix, uh, and some biomarkers of organ dysfunction and lactate production. So, you know, it's, it's fairly easy without any sophisticated monitoring or echocardiograms or anything like that to realize that this guy is clearly uh, in shock. Um, and I think we have to decide sort of what to do with this guy fairly quickly because things could uh, continue to get worse and worse. From an etiology standpoint, cardiogenic shock we know is, fortunately for us, I think primarily uh, LV damage, right? So mostly uh, ischemic heart disease, LV damage. So it kind of simplifies the, the pathway uh, where we could take a lot of these patients. Uh, and it's been troubling, you know, uh, physicians for, for, for since the beginning of time and uh, as far back as you can find literature, you know, they keep talking about it. And, uh, obviously requires correction of remedial defects in cardiopulmonary pumping. So we sort of knew that you have to deal with the cardiac standpoint uh, first and foremost. Uh, the guidelines of the past number of years uh, do sort of allow us to sort of, you know, confirm the diagnosis that the, the shock is of cardiac origin with various biomarkers, uh, imaging and uh, ECGs, uh, um, investigation for alternate causes of shock like pulmonary emboli, uh, hemorrhage, uh, sepsis, so on that should be managed by your allied uh, healthcare practitioners. Um, evaluate for most medical complications if it's a late presentation, ischemic heart disease like uh, VSD or ruptured papillary muscle and so on. Uh, and then re revascularization clearly is a primary therapy for uh, regulating uh, the primary ischemic heart disease cause of shock. The other important aspect is they definitely support the fact that you know, supplemental uh, support for organ perfusion is critical because if you don't die from cardiac causes, you'll die from multi organ failure, from, um, uh, multi -organ, from uh, ischemic uh, organ damage. Bottom line, we know that for a lot of patients, they will show up with an acute uh, ischemic event that are in shock, emergency revascularization is uh, primordial. 
whether you have uh, access to in-house PCI or emergency cabbage under certain anatom anatomical situations uh, or fibrinolysis if you're uh, further removed from primary uh, PCI centers. Intraorbital balloon pumps, as initially they were recommended, have sort of fallen out of way because of uh, AIBP2 shock uh, and other um, uh, data that suggested that potentially could be a falsely reassuring in revascularized shock patients where you don't as much need blood pressure as you need cardiac output. And since the, BP, the AIBP doesn't provide much output, uh, you might have a normal blood pressure, but you won't perfuse the organs and you might die from, uh, from ongoing shock. Alternate devices like uh, LV assist devices are becoming more and more um, uh, practical to use as they're percutaneously inserted and available in more and more centers uh, that do primary PCI. Uh, and those should be sort of a rapid alternative in a patient, in the face of a patient who's uh, deemed not to be doing well or uh, not doing well in spite of multiple attempts. More recent guidelines uh, from Europe, 2016, uh, do give the whole panel a slew of, um, of suggestions in terms of invasive monitoring, uh, trying fluid challenges if the patient is deemed to be hypovolemic through assessment of uh, volume status, uh, the use of ionotropic agents or vasopressors, which again are recommended, but no real clear guidance is, uh, is done as to these um, two medications. And I think a lot of people kind of haphazardly randomly use them just to maintain a map uh, without necessarily following other markers. And that's probably one of the reasons why our patients uh, don't do as well as they, I, I think they should. Uh, balloon pumps not recommended and short-term mechanical support, again, sort of is, is fairly high up on the recommendations if you have access to or if you can send someone for that. But again, I think one of the problems, uh, at least for mechanical circulatory support, which I'm, uh, I'm realizing when you read the literature and how it's not really improving outcomes as much as you think it would, uh, I think is a concept that, you know, you have to be in refractory shock before considering these devices, or at least that's how a lot of people will sort of think that they've tried everything, vasopressors, fluids, ionotropes, and after a certain amount of time, they're still not doing well, then you support, suggest a mechanical support device, which I think might be the problem or the definition of a refractory shock. You might already be outside of the window where you might benefit from such device. Uh, so I think that should be moved up in the strategy as to when it's considered, as I'll mention it later on in my talk. We know the primary PCI in terms of both the acute vessel, the culprit vessel, or potentially uh, multi-vessel revascularization patients with shock uh, can show some promise as well in, in centers that are aggressive uh, uh, or with no uh, surgical backup immediately. And, you know, in spite of that, we still have, you know, lots of drugs we can use for, for all forms of shock. We have lots of toys we can use, uh, uh, a lot of them available uh, at uh, larger centers uh, nearby. Uh, but yet, you know, people, people are still dying. And I think what's important to realize is that, you know, the numbers really haven't changed that much for patients who present in shock already to the hospital. I think we've re reduced the new incidence of cardiogenic shock with early revascularization. But I think those who are already in shock that present we're really stuck with a problem that uh, doesn't get better uh, quickly and the mortality stays high. Probably one of the issues is that it's a very heterogeneous population. Someone could be very young or very old. They could have uh, early presentation or could be a fairly late presentation, 24, 48, 72 hours after their initial ischemic event, various comorbidities. So the population that comes into the cath lab or the ICU or CCU uh, is, uh, is not necessarily going to respond the same way to a standard type of approach. And that's what makes uh, the management quite difficult. Difficulty, difficulty predicting who will not improve within four to six hours. And I think the four to six hours is an issue where a lot of patients will be sent from the cath lab to the CCU uh, and have blood work done the following morning, which might be an issue because you may miss that window of opportunity to notice a patient who's deteriorating in spite of their uh, revascularization procedure. I think there's a reliance on too many vasopressors, again, that increase blood pressure but don't necessarily improve perfusion, as those two parameters are not necessarily related. Uh, and the hesitation to place advanced mechan mechanical support, whether your hospital doesn't have a, an organized a shock team or the, the, the difficulty in deciding to when to transfer someone or someone who's too uh, unstable to, to transfer, uh, the cost of devices, you know, do you think you have to put, you know, uh, $20,000, $30,000 devices in so many people uh, that it's going to be uh, excessively expensive? And does your center have the expertise to, to put them in as well as to manage them afterwards? As well, for some patients, maybe it's just too late and you have to realize that early on and, uh, and offer palliative care sooner than later. So do you appreciate how sick the patient is? I think often, like for even for heart failure, both chronic or acute and for cardiogenic shock, 
I think we have a tendency to sort of underestimate mortality if a couple of numbers are reassuring, like a blood pressure, uh, or if the patient is, is awake, then we'll say he's probably fine after his approximately DPCI, but uh, he might still be uh, very sick. Um, and I think that it's important to sort of make sure we follow uh, organ uh, perfusion markers to see if uh, indeed their shock is either stabilizing or resolving. Uh, and that's not something that's routinely done in a lot of uh, CCUs as we're very cardiocentric. We'll look at uh, you know, blood pressure and EKGs and biomarkers like troponins and so on. But I think in, um, what we learned from the critical care environment is that looking at all sorts of other organ uh, dysfunction parameters like uh, urine output, creatinine, uh, lactates and so on, uh, those are other markers that can help us improve uh, the, the overall perfusion of uh, the patient and their survival. We know that uh, someone who does present in shock, whether it's a STEMI or non-STEMI, has a cardiac arrest or no cardiac arrest, the mortality rates tend to be sort of five to seven times that of someone who is not in shock. Um, and as much as you know, uh, a STEMI in the emergency room causes alarms and call the cath lab stat and he has to be out of here uh, within minutes, uh, you know, all comers, they have a mortality about 6%. Um, and if you look at uh, patients with cardiogenic shock, uh, you know, we have a mortality that's up to 10 times that, and we don't have the same sort of early goal-directed uh, mentality as we uh, probably should. Septic shock is another example that had very high mortality rates even 10 years ago, and I think there's been a huge push to sort of aggressively manage these patients as early as possible, and mortality rates have decreased uh, by up to 50% uh, because of early institution of resuscitation, antibiotics, source control, um, and ad uh, adequate perfusion monitoring within hours of institution of your, of your therapy. So who's in shock? I think that if you don't have uh, any markers of perfusion, I think that just, the, just looking at the number of IV pumps that are at the bedside of the patient and the drugs that are going in, uh, this is taken from a series of cardiac surgery patients where obviously the higher the dose of a medication or the number of medications, catecholamines used, uh, to keep the patient uh, alive, I think definitely uh, inversely correlates with uh, survival. And this has been sort of, um, again, uh, brought to the point where your resistance might be increased to pharmacological thresholds to maintain the blood pressure, but it in no way assures that your cardiac output or organ perfusion is adequate, which can cause you to continue going to multi-organ failure from ischemic injury. And this has been revalidated in a more contemporary sort of uh, cardiogenic shock population, not a post-op cardiac surgery population, where again the number of uh, the drugs used inversely correlate uh, with survival. Whether we can improve survival in, in, in all these patients, I think, uh, depends on a lot of factors. I think uh, uh, the patient itself uh, might be in shock for a prolonged amount of time, um, or the, uh, the risk that he might develop shock later than we think. So he might be in shock initially when he shows up to the cath lab or when he's transferred up to the CCU, but he might develop shock overnight, six to 12 hours later, or he might uh, have a recurrent ischemic event uh, two or three days later in hospital or in CCU and develop shock at that point. So I think these are very high risk patients that we have to keep an eye on uh, for, for at least the first 12 or 24 hours. Uh, what we potentially might underestimate as well is sort of the combination of, uh, of other factors like ischemic reperfusion injury to the myocardium after revascularization, uh, multi-organ ischemic injury from the initial cardiac arrest or hypoperfusive period. Um, and again, there's a point where patients might be transferred to your, to your cath lab or your center uh, after several hours or a day or two of, uh, of management and it might be already too far at that point to sort of uh, offer any type of uh, salvage. One of the, the sub-studies of the shock trial did uh, show that about 50% of patients will be in shock uh, within six hours of presentation to the post-ACS to your hospital. But again, close to 50% of the patients might develop shock over the course of your hospitalization. So the moment he goes up from the cath lab to the CCU, he might look okay, he might still be peeing, his lactate might initially go from four to three, uh, but I think overnight you have to clearly keep an eye on him because uh, he might develop shock over the next uh, several hours. And if we look at some of the mechanisms behind that, so with your primary PCI, which we think is the, uh, the therapy for ischemic myocardium, which it is, but again, the reperfusion injury can actually worsen initially cardiac function uh, at that point. Uh, and what's been uh, studied in some post-cardiac surgery patients after revascularization, 
uh, is where after initial vascularization state, your cardiac performance might initially improve and then decrease, which might explain some of the reasons why your shock might be delayed for a number of hours after your revascularization period. Secondarily, you have a patient at this point who might be uh, sedated, intubated, uh, be on analgesics, uh, being given diuretics, uh, and he might sort of develop more of a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. They might give him more of a vasoplegic shock on top of his already cardiogenic shock, which might account for one of the reasons why some patients will tend to get worse 24 to 48 hours later, as their adrenergic tone is suppressed through pharmacological therapy and as uh, through the systemic inflammatory response syndrome that starts to take over uh, the rest of their compounding uh, shock. Worsening shock obviously will have an impact on all the organs of the body, and I think uh, the, uh, the sepsis uh, networks and uh, intensivists have realized that a lot of markers of bad outcome immediately on arrival to the emergency room or into the intensive care unit is definitely by keeping an eye on what is the, the initial function or injury to the peripheral organs, which gives you a baseline uh, starting point as to where your patient uh, is going and then following all these parameters uh, to see if they're getting better or worse with your instituted therapy. And uh, a lot of the worsening patients uh, comes from in part the, uh, the initial ischemic uh, injury you get to the gut. And we know that the gut, once it starts to become uh, ischemic, you have a mucosal barrier disruption increased permeability, and then a bunch of endotoxins and bacteria can circulate in the body, and that might obviously will compound uh, your patient's care uh, in initially being cardiogenic and then turning into more of a multi-organ failure, SIRS component of a non-ischemic origin. And we know that someone who's in severe SIRS post-cardiac arrest or post-shock has a mortality at least as bad as someone who shows up with septic shock. As you can see, the overlapping curves of severe sepsis versus non-infectious uh, systemic inflammatory response. So bottom line, you might end up taking care of your patient more as a septic shock patient uh, after the first 12 to 24 hours. And therefore, you know, management of all the organ functions, which tend to parallel each other, be it sepsis or non-sepsis, uh, is very important to, to keep an eye on. So can we do better to predict who will do poorly? I think uh, there's, if you look at all the papers that uh, recruited patients who were in shock originally, uh, you can tweeze out certain high-risk criteria on admission as they come into the cath lab or into the CCU. Uh, as we do in critical care and as I think more and more people are doing in, in cardiology, obviously certain risk scores can help you sort of decide which patients should clearly be um, instrumented and followed way more intensively um, than, than others who could put in, a, who don't necessarily need a, an art line or a central line or a thing like that. Um, and as well as some ability to sort of make sure you, mar you have measures of perfusion, because often it's the perfusion itself that will kill the patient from multi organ failure. And then obviously, if you have access to these devices or if you're able to transfer someone to a center that has access to devices, anticipatory advanced support in the case of someone who may not be getting better uh, is always uh, critical. So who goes into shock? If you look at various trials, they look at anybody who's had uh, resuscitated cardiac arrest, late presentation ACS, proximal AD lesions with very large territory of ischemia necrosis, multivessel disease, persistent hypotension, lactic acidosis, and signs of uh, hyperperfusion on, on admission. Other parameters that can be potentially used if your patient has a right heart cath or a swan is inserted at the time of uh, arrival to CCU, uh, cardiac power just being a mathematical combination of your MAP times your cardiac output uh, correlates fairly nicely with, uh, with mortality of your patient and might help you sort of decide whether this is someone who might need either more inotropes as opposed to vasopressors or mechanical support to, as a salvage uh, device. Other scoring systems like the card shock score, again, sort of help you assess mortality versus uh, physiological parameters you can fairly easily measure and are routinely measured uh, in a uh, CCU upon admission. And the importance, I think, is you know, at early identification of the high-risk patient where you're dealing with very substantial mortalities. Uh, so I think it's not, uh, it's not unwarranted to fully instrument these patients as we do in the CCU with septic, sept septic shock patients with an art line, central line, Swan-Gans catheter if, if necessary to follow perfusion uh, and other parameter uh, uh, organ function parameter um, uh, measurements. Uh, because these are patients that might uh, get better, and fortunately so, but if they do get worse, you'll know about it way sooner as opposed to only the following morning. So 
the current devices we have access to will deliver cardiac output, so that's what's going to keep the body alive and help potentially uh, uh, offload the, the heart, as opposed to a balloon pump, which cannot supply the uh, cardiac output necessary to uh, maintain the other organs alive. So as you look at through the literature and other organ systems, I think uh, early implemented care and resuscitation is uh, fairly standard across the board, be it the golden hour of trauma, early golden hour therapy and sepsis, uh, code STEMIs, golden hour of strokes, uh, you know, code blues and acute heart failure syndromes. Uh, I think a lot of people definitely uh, require diagnosis and initial management from the first few minutes of uh, admission to the first couple of hours. Uh, which doesn't necessarily tend to be the case for, uh, for cardiogenic shock. And we know that septic shock has potentially mortality that's documented about 8% per hour. Uh, and I would, uh, although it's difficult to prove, but I think it's, uh, I would suspect that someone who's in cardiogenic shock, who's not responding by increasing perfusion, probably has a similar mortality rate per hour as well, which means that by the next morning, he might have an 80% mortality rate and it's too late to do anything the following morning. We know the door to balloon times that are shorter improve uh, survival. We know that uh, there's a, probably a window of opportunity within the first four to six hours of someone who's in shock uh, with a STEMI to, to be able to help them improve their mortality. Um, but that means that you know, it's not someone who should be strung along with various tests and a balloon pump and seen around it the following morning 12 hours later because you might lose your ability to salvage that patient. If you die of multi organ failure, even with a support device, I think uh, you unfortunately were too late. I think the ischemic burden on the peripheral organs are what will take over and will uh, dictate the mortality of your patient. And uh, the current recommendations uh, do highlight that, where initially we were sort of using MCS, be it ECMOs, impellas, or tandems, uh, sort of in a uh, uh, post circulatory collapse or reactive manner. Uh, where organ dysfunction is already permanently installed or irreversible. And these days, we, since they're more easily available, uh, more easily insertable, we tend to do it in an anticipatory uh, way that lowers mortality. So last couple of slides just to conclude. So we know that, again, multiple examples were earlier door to LV support times to help correct shock have reduced mortality rates significantly, and this on an hour-by-hour hour basis. So the earlier you are, even by a couple of hours, your survival can, can almost potentially double. Um, and every patient is different, and I think that's the problem. You might revascularize a patient, you might do better, or he might do worse. Uh, or some patients, you have no idea what they're gonna do because they're gonna develop a pneumonia, they're gonna start bleeding, and this and that, and, and I think that's why uh, it's not necessarily a linear uh, evolution. And when do you institute a certain mechanical support after a certain period of time of, uh, of waiting to see if it gets better or not? I think you might be either too late uh, or you might be just the right time. And that's a question that nobody really knows, but obviously I think the earlier the better uh, if you have access to that within a few hours. So the bottom line is to reach your, uh, cut off your systemic inflammatory response spiral to as early as you can before you reach refractory shock. Um, and if you have to treat the heart, you have to revascularize it, offload the LV to help improve recovery, but you also have to save the body. Make sure you perfuse the organs adequately so they can stabilize and improve, which potentially means using mechanical support earlier than later. Um, and again, the problem is that we have patients, the type of disease they have, duration, severity of uh, illness of the patients that show up is very variable, and therefore your outcomes be very variable. And so far it's been quite difficult to identify who's the patient who gets the absolute benefit, but I think we have to keep refining these criteria to be able to identify these people from the outset to give them the best benefit. There we go. Thanks.